Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. It's time for Off the Press, where we take you through the front pages of our national dailies. We have Upunabo Nkotaria, who is a public affairs analyst. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Mercy. Good morning, Justin. Good morning to you. All right, so uh, as usual, I start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. Let's find out uh, what big stories we have. Sultan. JIN declares special prayers in North, and uh, that's the board caption on a leadership newspaper this morning following the rising insecurity uh, that does need for prayers. Says federal government must protect the people from terrorist bandits, urge government at all levels to brace up to the challenge of governance. Troops kill 20 bandits in Zamfara. Uh, this is some of the uh, riders you find underneath the board caption. ECOWAS leaders must save region from insecurity, COVID-19. That's what the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, is quoted to say. And underneath, uh, you also have another caption saying, 42 billion naira NAS renovation contract followed due process. That's what FEM is quoted to say. Gives records of previous jobs. NFF sacks uh, Gennett Raw appoints... An interim coach uh, find out all of the details this morning on the leadership newspaper. And you also find no TIN required to operate bank accounts in, in finance bill. That's what the Minister of Finance is quoted to say, Zainab Ahmed. And uh, let's just see if we can check out another headline before we move away. Uh, that's the much we can take this morning on the leadership newspaper. Right away from the leadership, we'll move on next to the Daily Trust uh, newspaper, making ban a headline at uh, the travel by the Omicron, you know. But Daily Trust captions it this way, uh, passengers stranded over a fresh Nigerian UAE row, uh, with some riders there, agents, travelers count losses. Stakeholders commend the federal government's teeth for tat, uh, seek review of pacts. Federal government reciprocates travel ban against UK, Canada, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, okay, uh, that's uh, the main story. Then uh, reactions as the Emirate turbans uh, Buhari's uh, son. Just below the mast, his subsidy, uh, Daily Trust economists seek injection of a two trillion in education health all right uh, what buhari is doing to tackle insecurity uh, that's according to the president's uh, presidency if you want to find out uh, check the daily trust for that uh, pandemonium as uh, kidnappers invade to rob a market abduct traders a more stories on the Daily Trust this morning. Federal government college burning care be 181 days. Uh, that's following uh, school children in captivity. All right, uh, let's see if we can take more. Uh, 188 million uh, transactions are uh, recorded on e Naira platform. Mm. Uh, since October 2 months, 188 million. Fine. Now, NFF uh, sacks uh, Janet Raw appoint uh, a Guavon interim super egos boss. Uh, Emo monarchs abducted places or palaces, rather, set on fire. Those are the main stories you can find on the front page of the Daily Trust uh, this morning. Let's take a look at the Daily Times newspaper this morning. Uh, almost similar with what you have on the leadership newspaper. Buhari to echo as leaders. We must forge stronger solidarity to tackle new challenges. Uh, that's what you find on the Daily Times newspaper. ECOWAS leaders ask international community to support sanction against Guinea and Mali. Nigeria in distress due to citizens' misdeeds, grafts, political recklessness. That's what the Sultan is quoted to say. Nigeria is not being governed, says Utomi. Uh, you also find... Federal government to ban flights from the United Kingdom, Canada, Saudi Arabia, and Argentina. This is some of the headlines on the Daily Times newspaper. And just before we move away, the Finance Bill 2022. Team not required to operate bank account, presidency source. And NFF appoints a Guavo interim Super Eagles boss and sacks war. Uh, this is some of the headlines on the Daily Times newspaper. Away from the Daily Times, uh, we'll move on next to the Punch uh, newspaper. All right, we won't reverse travel ban over federal government's threats. That's according to the United Kingdom. With some uh, uh, writers there, uh, 
Press statement on travel ban stance despite federal government's planned retaliation. High Commission is saying UK others lack moral rights to allow their airlines to come to Nigeria, says Aviation Minister. We have recommended the travel ban for Canada, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, others. So I guess most of the papers uh, have that on their front pages uh, this morning. Above the masthead, there are some interesting stories you can find there. Uh, COVID-19 infections rise by 326.67% uh, in one week. Nigerians shun safety rules. Court stops trial of ex-army chief offers over 13.8 billion naira fraud. Reps invite Malami Adebayo FIRS as controversy emerges over tax holidays. Uh, just above that one on the blue strip there, over 500 um, million pushed into extreme poverty over health care costs, according to the World Bank and um, WHO. Uh, just uh, below the pictorial there, uh, Buhari governors orders more VIPs strong uh, Obumosho as Song or Song dies at 95. Ghanaian, two Nigerians nabbed with 10 kilograms of cocaine, a 1 million tramadol capsules seized. A right, a wife boats door as Ogun pastor allegedly rapes teenage chorister couple arrested. Kogi drags EFCC to court over controversial 19.3 billion naira fund, demands 35 billion naira. Again, gunmen invade the local government, abduct businesswoman, smash uh, farmers' head, uh, 53 UI lecturer's salaries not paid since December 2020, according to Asu. Buhar, okay, that's all we can find on the Punch newspaper this morning. All right, let's head straight to having Opuna Bonkotari join the conversation this morning. We do appreciate your time. Once again, good morning, and thanks for joining us. Good, good morning. Good morning. Okay, so let, let's start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. I mean, the concerns about insecurity in Niger and the fact that you also have some quotas calling for prayers. What are your thoughts? You can also join that with uh, the president calling on ECOWAS leaders to save the region from insecurity and COVID-19. Well, um, calling on God, making supplication is normal, especially when you've lost faith in the ability of the government to address the security challenges. Uh, the security challenges, definitely the banditry, kidnapping have all assumed apocalyptic dimensions. Uh, you get up in the morning, especially if you're in the north or in the east, and you're able to go back home safely, you thank your God for that day. Because even while sleeping, you don't know what might befall you or befall your uh, family, your household. So they've lost faith. There's despondence in the land. They've lost faith in the government to address these issues, and so they make their supplications to God, calling on him for divine intervention. Uh, there is nothing wrong, especially when you consider the fact that these are religious, these are clerics, making this call, these are prayers to God, that still help us, because they do not speak to the government. And if you also observe, um, you find out that even the government on its own part, I will say, and I, I keep saying, is complicitous, because I just heard Gumi recently when he said because the court had declared um, the bandit terrorist is now going to kill himself. First and foremost, he was never appointed by anybody. So one begins to wonder why Gumi will carry out all his deeds with impunity without anybody questioning him, inviting him, interrogating him, and so on. And that's why I think the government is actually complicit us. But they keep raiding and invading the East for crimes that are less when compared to what he is doing and his cohorts. So I agree. Even the Sultan of Sokoto recently has been outspoken. He has been talking. He is quite outspoken for Sekarov on these issues. He has to be because one, he's um, in charge of the Muslim faith. That is one. And two, his own people are the ones that are dying. When these people raid and they kill, uh, they don't consider your religion. They don't consider your ethnicity. 
All right, uh, uh, Punabo, let's uh, slide on to the Daily Trust. Uh, virtually all the papers um, have that um, as their um, story or on their front page uh, this morning. The Daily Trust uh, captions it this way. Passengers stranded over fresh Nigeria, UAE. Uh, I ask for you to offer divine assistance. But in this particular case, it is because the federal government has refused there is repudiation of obligation has refused to their license or possibilities and so they, their hands are fettered. They have no other choice. You can't carry arms. And so when the Minister for um, Defense once said Nigerians should arm themselves, I, I, with due respect to him, I, I, I wonder this serenity and setting for him to accept. How will I defend myself against those carrying AK-47 with bare hands? And so the, even the um, bill on handling of and uh, uh, permitting individuals to carry arms that is before the National Assembly is a welcome development. But even at that, uh, what are you, you can't you be allowed to carry AK-47. Assault rifles are not going to be permitted. So even at that, it is just uh, like sketching, sketching the issues. It is not really what I call philanthropic capitalism. You are just sketching the issues. It is not really addressing the issues. Because this one's come with AK-47, I also hear AK-49. So what are you going to do? The only difference is that it is he who pulls the trigger. But you're not talking, that you're not, the war is not against an individual. You're talking of a group of people attacking maybe, you have like 100 X-Men, 100 bandits, invading maybe, just attacking just 10, 20, 30 persons. How are they going to defend themselves? So you will find out that it, it, it's a complex situation. So these people, have, they have to have faith anymore in the government. They now call on God. God, please come and help us. Come and save us. All right, up, that has been all right. It is all right. Yeah, open up. But what I actually asked uh, was for to get your comment concerning the uh, Nigeria uh, UAE row. Uh, now passengers uh, stranded over the fresh um, row. That's the way the Daily Trust is captured. I just want to get your you know candid opinion concerning uh, the travel ban and of course uh, the recent development. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the travel ban is completely unnecessary. To so me, these are just specious reasons. I believe there are other uh, surreptitious reasons that are yet to be made known, disclosed to Nigerians. Otherwise, why are you going to ban? Then you're going to forever ban. Because you all forever have these barriers. It will not end. So you're going to ban. And we all know the effect of all these bans. Now look at people are stranded. Even if you have to ban, there has to be some extenuating circumstances. You don't ask are you allowed to be standard and effort. Now, what is the logic there? What if they already have the barriers? They are already carriers. They are going to spend it there. And if they are already carriers and their lives are in danger, then what happens? If they are going to also be there. What are the measures taken to address the issues, their problems, if, if they have medical challenges? I don't think the panacea, I've always said it, is a ban. It is not a ban. It should be seen viewed as malaria, typhoid, where you go for treatment for those who have not who are yet to be vaccinated. You ensure that before they travel out, they are vaccinated. That is no problem. And when they get to your country, of course, you need you confirm to be sure that they are actually vaccinated before you let them in. Because these things are affecting businesses. But you just come up with a blanket ban. Oh, any, any, a no plane for nobody, you know, immigrant from Nigeria, or uh, most of these West African countries, or the South African It is extremely bad. It is, to me, it is a clear case of racism. It tells you how they view us with so much indignity. So I completely condemn it. I don't subscribe to a ban. But I subscribe to stringent measures being put in place in order to rein in the uh, spread of this disease of this COVID-19, because it has come to stay. It is going to be like malaria. It's going to be like typhoid. So are you going to ban forever? So the reciprocal gesture by the federal government is a welcome development. That is to let them know that we are not in any way an inferior nation. We are not a punitive nation. We also have our rights. And our sovereignty must be respected. If you do this to me, of course I'm going to retaliate. And let's see how it works. Unfortunately, Babacha did it in those days, and he didn't bother 
But unfortunately, our leaders are so corrupt that a lot of Nigerians depend on international trade. A lot of Nigerians believe that their bread could be buttered abroad because of the harsh economic situation we are, we are facing in this country. Otherwise, why do you have to come out? If you talk of a ban in the 70s and early 80s, no Nigerian would have voted. I remember, as far back as 84, I, I was spending a Naira in London, and I was well appreciated and respected in 84. Yes. But today, you can't do that. The Naira is worthless, it's bulliness, as a result of our cataclysmic leadership time. And that is why a lot of people are worried. Otherwise, if you say you want to ban, ban, I don't give a damn about it. You can ban. But a lot of Nigerians depend on their daily bread from outside the country. In synopsis, the ban is completely unnecessary. And I can tell you that very soon we will get to the facts, though the truth, it will be disclosed, the truth behind this ban. I don't think it's all about COVID. COVID is just the special reason being advanced. It's not about COVID. Right. What you need to do, okay, for example, now, you are either have COVID. And I, I, I travel out. I get to your airport. I only even if I bought the plane to confirm that I have COVID, you send me back. If I don't have COVID, no let me fly. It's as simple as ABC. So why are you going to ban? Why why you why are you a blank why must it be a blank thing? It is extremely wrong, completely unacceptable, ridiculous, and I'm out front on Nigeria that we should not be taken to treat with levy. So I like the reciprocal guest. Right. Okay, so um, let's also look at the Daily Times newspaper this morning and the concern uh, from Patu Tami is saying that Nigeria is not being governed. Opona Bonkutare. He's saying that Nigeria is not being governed. Nigeria is not being governed. Yes, due to all of the happenings that we're experiencing. <coughs> and well, that is, uh, that, that is uh, a reflection of his feelings. When you take under advisement the overheated political engine, uh, steadily inflammatory economic atmosphere, and the highly combustible social climate, you will agree to a very large extent that Nigeria is not governed. It's a country that is factitious. We have problems left, right, and center. And unfortunately for us, we have a president that is on a long journey of lethargic sleep and inertia. He's yet to return. And that's why I say he's not government, because things have done arbitrariness is just the end of the day. Everybody, the chief, the NSA does his own, the FBF does his own. Chief of staff does it so there is no cohesion, there is no synergy. And as a result of this, you have commotion in the whole system. Even the economy is not being addressed. The security challenges are not being addressed. The political issue, of course, everything, everything is a portmanteau of issue. And that is why you say it is not being governed. In other words, you say you don't have the right leader. And so there is anarchy in the system. That is exactly my own extrapolation. That is what it means by Nigeria is not being governed. And in actual fact, it is not being governed. I completely agree with it. All right, let's uh, take some uh, stories from the uh, Punch newspaper, several stories. But let's talk about uh, the controversial uh, uh, 19.3 billion naira fund. Uh, the the Kogi state government um, has dragged the EFCC to court over that particular controversy, and they are demanding 35 billion naira in damages. Your thoughts, uh, Opunabo? Well, that's a good matter. Uh, the EFCC is the Kogi state governor of. Um, Fraud, embezzlement. I think uh, money that was released for bill out, they said it was uh, diverted into his own private account. Uh, an allegation the Kogi state government is investigating, saying, no, that's not true. And as a result of that, they seized there was a million on that account. And uh, the Kogi state government was curious and uh, reacted. 
And now they have all they came up with a, a statement trying to explain the policy based on that matter, uh, where the money was and how it has been used. I think um, it's a matter of integrity. And if it is true that the Kogu State government is innocent of the allegations, because you are withholding back such funds will have some serious financial implications of the economy of Kogu State. So the matter has been, is before the court. It has been uh, subjected to the clinical prognosis of the labor lab. Uh, we'll await the judgment. Right now, you cannot say yes, this is right. You cannot say the Kogu State government is right, or government is right, rather, although he personifies the government. So you cannot say yes, this is right. You cannot say uh, Kogu State government is right. It is before the court, so the court will explain and come up with the judgment. It's only at that point. We can categorically say Mr. A is right or Mr. B is right. But for now, it's something before the judiciary, so let's wait for the outcome before we actually make categorical statements and uh, not be pontificated on the All right, open up on Qataria. Let's also check out uh, the Punch newspaper this morning. Over 500 million pushed into extreme poverty over the health costs. And that's according to the WHO and also the World Bank. Over 500 million pushed into extreme poverty over health costs. Uh, that's according to, you know, experts from the oh, WHO. Okay, okay. So 500 million people, according to that report, oh, and uh, uh, yeah, by yeah, experts from... You. Okay, all right, then go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so, so but for, for me, the concern would be quite expensive. I, I was going to ask. Uh, the concern would be what? Go ahead. I'm listening. Okay. So I was going to ask. No, I'm if, listening. You said. I was going to ask if you think that you know the cost for you know health services would be enough to push 500 million persons into extreme poverty? More than enough. More than enough. It's even convoluted. First, if you, if you lack the basic diet, the balanced diet, you're going to fall sick. And when you fall sick, there is nothing you can do other than resort to medications, which is health. Now, if you have, let's say, hypothetically, you have 10,000 naira on you, and they say you have malaria, to treat that malaria will cost you 12,000 naira, or even that 10,000 naira. Meanwhile, you are not eating. What do you do? Because if you can't eat, you're going to die of malaria. So the first thing you do, which is just natural, is to treat the malaria. Believing you might eat, either in a friend's house or somewhere. And when you spend that 10,000 naira on malaria, treating yourself, you're empty. It has placed you dry. You can't feed. You can't afford, uh, afford the basic uh, necessities of life. You can't, you, you, you can't even uh, open your shop anymore because probably that was the uh, profit you made from the shop. You can't reinvest. So, now, this is just hypothetical. Not to talk of when you have cancer, when you have liver, liver problems, you have kidney problems, and so many other health-related matters. So, if that a lot of people are even on admission in the hospital, and have been abandoned, especially in the general hospitals, in the government hospitals, have been abandoned because they cannot put their medical bills, and some of them die. And that's why on, when you, you want to tune in today, you tune in to both of these stations, you hear people appealing to the public for funds, for treatment. Nobody goes on to say, please give me money, I want to eat. It is, it is hardly done. You have to see it. On a daily basis, you keep hearing, oh, Mr. A is suffering from kidney, Mr. B is suffering from cancer, he needs 10 million naira, he needs 3 million naira. Now, that appeal is a function of poverty. Otherwise, the families would have been able to spend to pay for them, but they cannot. So only the microscopic few can afford these things. They can even afford to travel out of the country, like Mr. President. They can afford all these things. But majority of Nigerians can barely feed, 
And a man that can barely feed cannot afford his medical bills. Not to talk of the medical bills of members of his family, relations, and what have you. And if you have it, you're dead. Okay, look at that. Somebody that is on, uh, uh, let's say, 300,000 or more. He has a medical challenge that is not of, it's not, it's not of his making, maybe cancer. And the doctors are asking him to bring 10 million dollars for treatment or for surgery. What happened? This is going to drive uh, any account, the wife's account, and will protect it. So health is actually one major problem that will definitely impoverish lots of Nigerians. So that is that's a very fact. part. It's a very disputable fact. Because between feeding, between school fees, between rents, and between car purchases and so on, the priority if you're sick will be to address that illness. Without it, you're going to die. So when it's life-threatening, even on many malaria, on many headache, if you have severe headache, you know how you feel when you have severe headache. And somebody tells you, please, give me a, will you eat? The person says, no, I can't eat. You lose appetite. You look for money to go and buy what will attend the day in the day. Or what will live in here? That's, that's the first thing that will play through your mind. And if you don't have it, what happens? Now, when you keep spending your money on health, that's why when you have a terminal illness, and you keep spending your money on health, you will find out that a lot of people sell living their properties to stay alive. A lot of people sell their properties to stay alive. So health is a major, major, it has a major impact on finances. And it has really drained lots of pockets. Lots of problems. I can't tell you. All right, Tupunabo, I don't know if you actually followed the Nigerian uh, football uh, you know, situation. And of course, uh, the NFF uh, is in the news. Uh. <laughs> 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 What does that even mean? Ask me chess and go. <laughs> leave, me, leave me out of football. I don't think if you are playing World Cup, all right. I'll into Africa magic. Like, let us look at something else. That I don't just... watch football at all. All right, 188 <laughs> million transactions are recorded on the e Naira platform. It's a belly. Uh, it's actually on the Daily Trust. It's barely about uh, two months since the launch of um, the, you know, the e Naira. And of course, what we have right now is about 888 million naira transactions recorded. Is that some good news? Uh, what are your thoughts exactly? Uh, well, it simply means it has been embraced, and it's quite favourable. Uh, it's welcome development. No doubt about that. Because within two months, you're talking about over 100, 180? Did you say 180? 188. 188. Oh, that's, that's huge. That's quite huge. Yeah, that's quite huge. I can tell you that. So it's a welcome development. Um, and well, you know, in Nigeria, it's always too early to plan. Because you always have people that will want to prevent the situation, sabotage the situation. But for now, it shows a some level of uh, acceptance, some level of appreciation, and that is why you have um, that much transaction, that number of transactions within two months. One, I can tell you, is quite key. Uh, but let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. Uh, I wait for the EFCC and so on, because very soon the EFCC will wait, we wait, we wait into these issues and will tell you the fraud and so on that are taking place. But for now, I think it's a welcome development. And we all like it. I have not started. I don't know if you have. So let's wait and see what happens. But for now, I commend it. It's a welcome development. It's ideated to um, reduce circulation, physical circulation of cash and so on. And it's the very largest thing going to ensure some level of transparency if the tracking system is good. So it's a welcome development, I agree with you. Okay, so as we coast it down now, let's quickly also still stay with the Punch newspaper. And the consensus has been raised by the Minister of Health, uh, saying that COVID-19 infection is on the increase uh, by 326.6% in one week. And also the fact that Nigerians have shown safety rules. Uh, I'd like to share your thoughts on that. What could be responsible? I mean, the letter part of it, uh, that's also one part I'd like you to share your thoughts. Why have we shown the safety rules, the wearing of the nose masks, uh, the social distancing, 
and of course um, constant washing of hands. Yes, Nigerians impugn the fact that you have COVID. Yes, COVID is, is real. That is it. The apocryphalness of COVID-19 is one major problem. Then, secondly, there is so much hunger in the land. So, between poverty, between hunger and COVID, I mean, as a result of the hunger in the land, a lot of people consign the issue of COVID into oblivion. In fact, a lot of them will just tell you, does COVID exist today? You know, that, that's the truth about it. So, it, it's more of, uh, when I think of waiting to talk first, if I talk of COVID. But then, the fact that the government has a role to play when it comes to enforcement. Uh, if, well, willy-nilly, that's whether Nigerians like it or not, if the government is sincere and is, is really ready to address this uh, enforcement of the safety, safety guidelines, the government can. If you find somebody on the road without a face mask, you are arrested. It's as simple as that. If you find, if, you, if there is a function and the social gathering distancing rule is not obeyed, of course, you arrest the, um, if it's a party, the, the, the organizers of the party and everybody that attended that party. When I mean arrest, you don't just arrest them, detain them and so on. You make them sure that they pay a token. Even if they have to pay 10,000, it will serve as a deterrent. And it will be etched in their memory that if we don't obey these rules, there's always a penalty. But when you carry, you, you disobey these rules with impunity, then you, well, how do you expect Nigerians to obey? So the onus is on the government to enforce these rules. Because if you let, as, as the other Nigerian, if you see no parking, no stopping, no hopping, I bet you, you see a taxi driver will stop exactly where they said no parking, no stopping. Then when you see the police approaching, it drives stop. So we need the iron hand in Nigeria to enforce laws. And the police should ensure that, and this medical officer should ensure that they enforce this thing. If you see me on the road, I've been in a taxi and no mask. The passengers and the drivers are not putting on their masks. You stop that taxi and arrest them and ensure that they all pay even in 10,000, even in 5,000 5, naira. The following day, they all carry their masks. Oh, but, um, oh, and the Kutari. police should be hidden. Let, let me come in there now. You, you also want to agree with me that belief informs action. Now, what people believe they, they become or they act. And you also would also want to agree with me that there are a lot of persons out there who do not believe in the existence of this virus. So, do you think that that's actually a better approach, trying to get them to comply, uh, you know, with the rules? Sorry? I'm asking if you think that that's a better approach to get people, because you also still have a number of, quite a number of persons who do not believe in the existence of this virus, not to even talk about uh, the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so um, is that the best approach to actually get people uh, to comply? How do people, you know, yes, who do not believe? Yeah, I, you know, I, talk, I, know, I, talk, I talked of the apocryphalness, but then now whether you believe or not is immaterial. That's one. Because we are talking of the safety of Nigerians. If you want to die, even when you want to commit suicide, it's an offense. Nevertheless, if you want to die, die in your bedroom. That's, uh, in your, in your, yes, die in your bedroom. Now, don't kill other people before you die. So it is the responsibility of government to protect lives and property. Now, if you don't believe, I know where you're, where you're coming from. You're talking about awareness. There is enough awareness. Nobody can say he's ignorant of COVID. It's just that they don't believe. So the issue of awareness doesn't arise. Because you are, we, are, we are aware. It is there. It's just enough. Some don't believe for religious reasons. Some just don't believe. They tell you, like, big, like you tell somebody, blind blood pressure, they send a big man problem, a big man sickness. You know? So I don't care whether you believe or not. Because the awareness is there. You can't, you can't dispute that fact. On daily basis, the awareness is there. You have enough campaign on COVID-19. So whether you believe or not, it's your bloody hell business. When the government, when the government starts enforcing these rules, then you, and the government is also protecting your life and the lives of others. The only difference is that you might not go for vaccination. That's just the difference. 
And that's where the campaign go. You go for vaccination. If you don't, but if you have your mask or you're not going to spread it. Because from what they said, it is when you sneeze, you cough, and so on, that you spread. So if you have your mask or you're not going to spread it. But you might not go for vaccination. Now, that is where the awareness comes in. Apart from the issue of vaccination, encouraging you to, to go and uh, 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 do the vaccination, the government must enforce. Once you enforce, a lot of Nigerians will ensure that they go by these rules, the guidelines. And by so doing, they will restrict the spread of the virus. That's why it is important for the government to enforce. Why they still carry on with the campaign, the awareness campaign, if you don't want to vaccinate, if you go for vaccination, it's your business. That's your business. But if you have the mask, you cannot. Stay. That's why it's important that you have your mask on. You wash your hands regularly. The awareness is good. But awareness without enforcement will amount to nothing. That's the point I'm making. All right, uh, we must say a very big thank you to you, uh, Oponabo Inko Taria, you know, for joining us this morning on Off the Press and, of course, uh, you know, analyzing all the papers and all the news on the front pages. We do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, it's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Away from Off the Press, uh, we'll be seeing what happened today in history. Today is the 13th of December. What happened in history in a moment? Stay with us.